for going above and beyond anything we could have ever been worthy of. Uh, you did it because you loved us. Darlene, it's good to see you sometime. Mr. Rich, it's good to see you as well. It's good to have Kevin and his family. Kevin and I have been very close for many years. I guess what? Oh, well over a decade, huh, Kevin? You're getting old, but <laughs> Glad to have he and his family here, his beautiful wife and son. One of the things we've been doing as of late is we have been looking for a better way of doing things. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe as human beings, we are always looking for a better way of doing things. Thank God that there have been people that have come before us who have been searching for a better way of doing things. Just some hundred years ago, if you were injured or wounded in battle, if you were lucky, you got some whiskey, a stick shoved in your mouth, and then they went to work on you. Thank God that we have come a long ways because people wanted a better way. Amen. Amen. One of the things I struggle with is I'm always searching for a better way. My wife will say often, why can't you just leave that alone? <laughs> it's working fine. Well, it may be working, but I'm always driven to see if there's a better way that we can do things. But I was asking God, I saw something this week on the internet, and I'll get to that in a while. And as I saw God, as this broke my heart, I was asking Him, God, there's got to be a better way. A better way of living, a better way of reacting, a better way of showing love, a better way of practicing what we preach. <laughs> and as I looked on and I had a discussion with someone I value very deeply in my life, and we were discussing this, and I was just absolutely heartbroken at what was taking place here. And I began to pray, and I said, God, there's got to be a better way. God showed me a better way. To my surprise, God spoke to me and said, I don't want to show you a better way. I have to say, I was concerned. It took me about a day, maybe a day and a half, and I was like, God, what do you mean you don't want to show me? You said, seek you. You said, knock, and I will find. Seek, and you will give wisdom and discernment. Once again, son, I don't want to show you a better way. Then he spoke again and said, I want to show you the most excellent of ways. The most excellent of ways. Now, when God tells me that he wants to show me the most excellent way of doing something, trust me, we should listen. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not going to be the one saying it. It's not coming just from your pastor or your preacher. It's not about remnant church. We are going to back it up as we always do with the word of God. Amen. So today, when I tell you he is going to show you the most excellent of ways, that is who's showing you. That is who is telling you. It is going to be the Word of God. So go ahead this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to begin at verse 1. If you do not have your Bibles, that's okay. The verses will be on the screen behind me. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Y'all like my new cup I got for Pastor Appreciation Day? Yeah, you like that, don't you? I think Kevin would like for me to have a tiger paw, wouldn't you, Kevin? <laughs> you didn't put Jesus in that case? <laughs> All right, let's begin today. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, before we go any farther, I want to go back to the last verse in chapter 12 because I want to explain something to you. Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth when he is writing this to them. You see, that church was on fire. That church was growing. The numbers were being added to daily. People were coming. They were operating in blessings and in spiritual gifts. So everything was rocking right along. Then all of a sudden, Paul gets a letter. Your boys in Corinth, they're starting to struggle a little bit. They're starting to have some fracturing, some division in the body. 
Some are beginning to think that their spiritual gifts and how they operate are more important than what their brothers and sisters are operating in. There is starting to be some division that has taken place in God's house. Well, this concerns Paul greatly. Rattles Paul's cage and Paul is not an easy man to rattle. And so he begins to write this book known as the love chapter. If you will go and do some studying, this chapter is known oftentimes as the love chapter in the Bible. And so Paul in the last verse of chapter 12, he says to them, I am going to show you the most excellent way. So what he is really saying to us is he's saying, I'm going to show you the best way to handle any problem, any situation, any turmoil, any uprisings, any fracturing, any divisions, any problems in your life. I'm not going to show you a great way. I'm not going to show you a good way. I'm going to show you the most excellent of ways. And so that's where we begin here in that most excellent of ways, guys. Now, this is deep. Get your pens ready. Ready? All right. Now get ready. We're about to use a four-letter word up in here. L O V E. Love. Love. No way it can be that simple, right? No way that that's the solution to everything. Because right now we throw around love. And it is a four-letter word, and we misuse it. I, I love that car. I love that team. I love that quarterback. I love that church. I love that person. I love that color. I love that purse. Love has truly been lost. It's lost its meaning to us. We've gotten away from what it means to biblically operate as we should as Christians and disciples in godly love. You want to know why churches are fracturing? And while people are splitting up, marriages are failing because we don't operate in love. Agape love. True love. Right? That is our problem and that is what Paul begins to speak to them about. And then he goes on. I love how Paul drives his point home. Paul gets a little gangster on you, if you will. And he drives his point home and he says, you know what, guys? If you speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, you are as a resounding gong or symbol. Now, Paul understood the importance of spiritual gifts. Let's be real clear on this because you can't really understand the gravity and weight of what Paul is saying to them and the importance that he's placing on that word love unless you understand what he's saying here. You see, he said, even if you speak in tongues, even if you operate in your spiritual gifts, that's all well and good. And now Paul's not bashing. Paul is saying you should. You should operate in those. You should seek those. You should have those functioning in a healthy body of Christ. That's not what he's saying. Remember, now Paul was there and understood that the very first gospel message ever spoken, ever preached, came from whom? Peter, on the day of Pentecost. The disciples were in the upper room. Jesus had said, it's good that I go away because when I do, I can send to you the Holy Spirit, your comforter. You will be endued with power from on high. Go and wait. Go and tarry. Sure enough, on the day of Pentecost in the upper room, the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. Then what happens immediately? Peter steps out in boldness and he begins to speak the very first gospel message that was ever preached. Then the disciples, men and women alike, begin to come out and they begin to speak in what? It says other tongues, other languages. Now, why would they do that? Well, they did it because this was during the Feast of Passover. And during the Feast of Passover in Jerusalem, people would come from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, from all across the world. They would make that journey to be in Jerusalem for that feast. And so the Holy Spirit did not want them to miss this very first gospel message that was ever spoken. So through them, he began to speak in other tongues and other languages so that all the men and women present that day could understand what he was preaching, what he was saying. So Paul, trust me, when I say he understands the importance of spiritual gifts, I promise you he does. But now then he goes on to say, as good as that is, as vital as that is, as important, healthy, biblical as that is. Hear me now. It is worthless. You are only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
Now that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but back in the day for first century believers, it would be very, very clear that Paul was making his point very, very strongly. Because back in the day, there were pagan temples, pagan worship, and gods that people would go in and they would worship them. And outside of those temples, they would have these giant gongs. And as people were coming in, the worshipers were coming in to serve us, to sit and to pray before they would begin service. These servants would go out and they would beat on these giant gongs. And they did this in hopes that all of the racket, all of the noise would awaken their God. So that maybe he would hear their prayers. Now do you catch what Paul is saying? Do you understand what Paul is saying now? Have you ever been? Hmm, about to hurt some things. Have you ever been to a service? Have you ever been to a church? Hands are raised. People shout. They run the aisles. They speak in tongues. They act all holier than thou or full of the Holy Spirit. And then they get done. And what do they say? Boy, we had a rock and sock em service today. People were speaking in tongues and people had their hands raised and they were being slain in the Spirit. Man, you should have been there. But here's what really happens. I've been there. I've seen them. Most of you have too. You can't get from the front of the aisle to the back of the door before the backbiting starts, the gossiping starts, the talking about everybody else starts, the bad-mouthing everybody else starts, the it was too hot, it was too cold, he was too loud, the song was too soft. Did you notice that it had technical difficulties? The A.D. guy wasn't doing his job. You can't get from point A to point B before you start gossiping and tearing down your brother. Yeah. So guess what we're not operating in? Love. And that's what he's saying. If you're one of those and you're one of those churches and you're doing that, he said you're as worthless as in the servant that's standing out there beating on that cone. All God hears is static. All God hears is noise. It isn't going to awaken him and he isn't going to pay you a lick of attention. Amen. And he will not honor it. Do it all you want, he said. Do it all you want, but if you're not doing it right and biblically and with love at the forefront of everything that you do, you might as well be this poor old guy here beating on a gong in hopes of awakening a dead God. Amen. What are we doing? How are we operating? Guys, how far have we got? You've been there. I see by the look on your face. I've been there. I've seen it done right. Make no mistake and done right. Oh boy. Change your life. Done wrong. It'll grow your church. It'll leave them hurt. It'll leave them broke. It'll leave them hurt. It'll leave them confused. It'll leave them fractured. How many churches do we know that base it on, well, this gift is more important? Come on. You hear me talking? Braxton, did you hit record? I hope you did. Yes, sir. It's the truth. Do you know how many times I've had to sit and my wife's going, shut your mouth, Scott, shut your mouth. And I'm going, that ain't in there. That ain't right. I don't care if I'm part of this denomination or not. That ain't biblical and that's not how it operates. And that's not what I read. That's not what I study. But this is what we believe. I don't care what you believe. What you believe has left everybody fractured and divided, and that's why we have 75 different denominations all around the world, and there's a church on every street corner, is because we're operating outside of what we should be, which is nothing but true love for Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. amen and amen. He says that is it. The most excellent of ways is a four-letter word, love. And he says it is more important than your spiritual gifts. It is more important than speaking in tongues. It is more important than healing. It is more important than prophecy. It is more important than teaching. All of those things you can do and operate in. But your church, the body of Christ, if it's not operating with love, it's worthless. Bunch of static. Bunch of noise. Let me tell you something. We got a bunch of people making a bunch of noise. We got a bunch of people making a bunch of rap. No lives are being changed. Come on. We got a bunch of people beating on their gongs, saying this is the only way. This is the right way. This is my denomination. This is what I believe. This is what I think. This is how we do it. It's not about what we want. It's not about what we think. It's not about what we want to do. It's about the most excellent of ways that he said we should do it. Right. Yes. 
This isn't my house. Amen. It's your house. Amen. This is his house. Amen. And we're going to do it the way he says to do it. And we're going to get a few things right. What have I told you? We're going to preach the word. And we're going to preach it in truth and boldness. And we're going to love each other. Because if we get those two right, all the rest will fall into place. Right? right? Amen. 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 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. Don't get me wrong. Paul here is not bashing on knowledge. Paul is not knocking wisdom. As a matter of fact, throughout the Bible it tells us we should seek knowledge. We should grow in His Word. We should study His Word. We should imprint His Word on our hearts and in our children, right? We should share it with them as we walk up and down the roads and as you're walking down the street and to your hunting blind and on the farm. You should be sharing that Word with your children. So very vital and important that we know it and we know what it means and how to apply it. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is you can have every theology, you can have every doxology, you can have all your eschatology, you can have any ology that you want to have, you can have all of the wisdom, you can know every book, you can know every verse, you can know how to do it, how to preach it, how to say it, how to apply it, know the context, but if you don't do it in love, he says you have nothing. This is what he's really saying to you right here. He's saying, I don't care how much you know. He's looking you dead in the face and saying, I don't care how much you know. I don't care how long you pastored. I don't care how well you know your Bible, your man-made doctrine, and your man-made theology. I don't care how much you know about it until I know how much you care about me. Do you know people aren't going to care about what's happening in Remnant until they know about how much you truly, genuinely care for them? What are we doing? Come to my church. Well, we have some rocking services. Do they, do they love them? Ah, oh, uh, man, come on now. Miss Brenda speaks in tongues. She'll pray for you. All right. It's good. Will they, will they love me? In my brokenness? Yes. Will they love me? When I fail? Will they love me? When my wife leaves me? Will you love me? When I fall back in to that addiction. Come on. Come on, Pastor. Will you love me? When you see me out in the street doing something I shouldn't do, saying something I shouldn't say, living in a way that I shouldn't live, are you going to condemn me or are you going to love me? Is your love based on me paying my tithes and showing up to your church looking like you say and following a list of rules? Or is your love based on the love of God and the word of God, which is unconditional love? Right. Now, here's the deal. I love you and I want you here. But I also have enough love to teach the whole word of God. My job is to take care of you, to grow you, and to teach you. But my most important job is to love you unconditionally. To love you regardless. To love you whether you show up or whether you leave. To love you whether you do something dumb. I do it daily. But guess what? We don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. Right? Prime example. Gentleman posted something on the news a couple of days ago. Terrible situation. Family getting divorced. This man happened to be a very popular pastor at one time. And I watched as comments began to be made. Page after page of comments from so-called pastors, from so-called leaders, from so-called Christians, Holy Ghost filled, Holy Spirit filled men and women of God. And guess what they did? Boy, they bent down and they picked him up and they dusted him off and they set him on his way and they said, we love you. Joe. What a joke. They crucified that man. They crucified him. They tore up his ministry. They shredded his wife. They shredded his family. They put him on blast for everything that they were worth. And the whole time that I was sitting there reading these, time and time again, I kept going, now hold on for a second.
said, and with all your doxology, all your theology, and all your biblical knowledge and wisdom that you claim to have. Because last time I checked, it said we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters regardless. Yes. It said that what in the Bible? That knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Yes. I saw a bunch of puffed up, scared, prideful men and women of God that were just jumping at the bit to tear someone down. Boy, I wanted to get on there so bad. Ooh. But I wasn't done it in love because I was angry. I was hurt. Can you imagine? Can you imagine with all these non-believers that go, well, man, I, I know there's something more. God, the church, I know my mom, my dad, my grandma. I know Kevin. I know uh, Miss Vanessa and Bobby asked me to go to church. But, dude, do you, God, wait. These jokers are lethal. Yeah. Yeah. I'd catch it worse going there. Can you imagine? They're doing a pastor that way, a man of God that way. They're crucifying him, killing his family, tearing him apart. All because he what? He did something we do every day, which is sin. Right. Every day, none of us are different. There is none that is righteous. No, not one. But yet they were picking up rocks and throwing them as hard as they can go yeah. while you live in a stinking glass house yeah. and you know you just as guilty as he is if I could open up your closet and dump it out in public. Yes, That's the truth. That's the truth. I'm broken. My closet door, I have to push on it and bar it and lock it to keep all of the junk and the garbage in my life from spilling out on a daily basis. That's who your pastor is. So don't be shocked when I fall. Don't be shocked if I fail. I'm making it clear now, I'm no different than you. I am no different than that man in that family. We are all, we are all capable. No, I can never do that. Oh, yes, you can. Yes. There's never a situation on the other is. I'm too strong. No, you're not. I'm too smart. I know the Bible. I know the Word. They had fallen prey to it, and they didn't even know it. Pride. Envy. Jealousy. That was all of their insecurities spilling out when they should have been loving their brother yes. and saying, by the grace of God, there go I. Amen. It's only because of his love and his mercy and forgiveness that that's not me. Paul said to them, you can speak in tongues. You can have all of the knowledge. But if you don't have love, you don't have anything. He says again in 1 Corinthians 8.1, knowledge puffs up. Write that down. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The power of your tongue. What are you doing with it? Are you using it to puff yourself up, your church up, your own pride, your own agenda, your own jealous ways? Are you using it to tear someone else down, to tear them apart? Or are you using it to speak life and love? Are you building them up because he says that is the most excellent of ways. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 13 2. Let's finish. If I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Did you hear that one? That one was a shot for me, brother. I mean, that one was a shot for me. Listen, you can have all the faith in the world, but if you have not love, you have nothing. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, all my life, from the time I was little, things are getting tough, boy. Show me faith. Boy, my marriage is failing. Come on, man, you got to have a little more faith. Things are heading south. I just lost my job. May not be able to. Oh, come on, man. You got to have faith. What Paul is saying here is faith is good. Faith is vital. 
But you can have all of the faith in the world. You can believe that Jesus came, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, spotless life, was sacrificed on our behalf, shed his blood, was crucified for our forgiveness and atonement of sins, was buried and on the third day rose again, ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father to be the one that is an intercessor for you and for me between us and God. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. You can have all the faith in the world, but if you don't have love, it's worth it. Mm. Think about that now. Let that one soak in for a minute. Believe all you want to is worthless. Pray all you want to. Have all the faith that God hears and that God's going to answer. It's worthless. If you don't have love. Man's walking down the road. Levi. Comes up, he looks over, he sees a man beaten, bloody, bruised, desperate need of help, desperate need of compassion. He sees the man and he sort of takes a few more steps and he backs around the road and looks on as he keeps walking, leaving the man there to struggle. Short time later, the priest walks by and sees the same man still struggling, still bleeding, still in need of love and compassion looks at the man, sneaks by on this side, watching, looking. Short time later, Samaritan walks by, sees the man, goes to the man, he helps the man, he addresses his wounds, he addresses his needs, he shows love, he shows compassion, he takes the man, puts him on his camel or donkey or horse, whatever it was he had, and he takes him in, and he pays the innkeeper, and he says, take care of this man. Dress his wounds, give him a bed, give him food, give him anything he needs. Now let me ask you a question. If you don't believe that that can be the case and that what Paul is telling us is true, do you believe for one second that that priest didn't have faith? Hmm. Do you believe for one second that the Levite, the Levitical priesthood, if you only knew we don't have time, trust me, the brother had some faith? Walk right by. Now the Samaritan. He may have not had the knowledge. Come on. He may have not had all your doxology, all of your theology, all of your Bibleology. He may not have had any of that. But guess what he had? He had love. He had compassion for his fellow brother and sister. And so he stopped and he did something about it. And he met them in their need. He met them at their place of need. Regardless of how it looked. Regardless of what it cost him. Regardless of what others may think. And he met him right there and he showed him love and compassion. Who do you think God wants to see? Who do you think God wants to see? A wreck. Dressed in fine linens, robes, toting their Bible, going to church, going to preach, and walking right by people daily as they sit there broken, as they sit there hurting, as they sit there sick, addicted, depressed, suicidal. And the whole time, he's saying, all I want you to do is love them. All I want you to do is love him. Say it again. All I need you to do is love him. Do you get it? Do we get it? Do we get it? All I want you to do is love him. It's not that hard. The book's not that complicated. Paul's making it very clear. You can do all of those other things, but don't even worry about those. Don't even think about those if you can't first operate in the most basic human principle that Jesus gave us to operate in through His Spirit. Love. You want to know love? For God. So love the world that he sent his son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son 
that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look how simple. Even in John 3.16, for God so going to be launching January 7th, Sunday. We better decide who we're going to be.